looks like we start recording a little half hour. <laughs> okay, so hopefully we are on now. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, I know that these are crazy times. Uh, most folks have been on lockdown. Others in different parts of the globe are always on lockdown. So I'm grateful to you for today's, for joining today's live chat and um, forgive us for the delays uh, because Facebook tends to do that to us uh, for some reason. Uh, my name is Jihan Hakim and I'm the chair of the Yemeni Alliance Committee. Um, we also go by YAK. And YAK is a team of Yemeni Americans from all fields. Um, that came together after the Muslim ban. Um, and we focus on advocating for Yemeni Americans and resisting against uh, anti-Yemeni policies. As you all know, we've been really laser focused on advocating for an end to US support to the Syrian-led coalition's aggression in Yemen, calling for an end to the coalition imposed blockade and for an end to US arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Um, US bombs kill Yemeni people. And it's been five years since the intervention began under Obama, and part of our advocacy work is sharing stories of those impacted by this brutal war. Um, so today the Yemeni Alliance Committee is going to be talking to Yemeni American Kemfer Abdullah from New York. Uh, she lived in Yemen from 2011 to like November of 2015, so we'll be able to get a glimpse into what Yemen looked like before the Civil War or during the Civil War and in the beginning of the intervention. A little bit about Kothar. Uh, Kothar's identity is formed in part through her experience living in Yemen and New York City. She has a deep passion for justice and fighting against inequalities on a global level. Kothar is a uh, batch BA undergrad student studying Middle Eastern studies and international relations. Uh, she wants to go to law school, inshallah, to further these objectives in the eyes of the law. Thank you so much for joining us, Kothar, today. Um, thank you so much, Jihan, for having me. Like you and the, and the Yemen Lions Committee do so much work for Yemen. And thank you just so much because like you're literally taking the lead on this. Um, so much. It's because of folks like you guys that we're able to really just um, uplift um, these stories and continue this fight that is so huge. Uh, the foreign policy and the war machine is, is huge. So um, I want to, if you can tell our viewers, what was life like in Yemen before you came to the U.S.? Some of the better memories. Um, so, so like when I was a child, I don't remember much, to be honest. Like, I don't remember it. Like, I was really young and just like my memories were like I always had fun when I went with my family we would stay like a few months and then come back because like we were we lived here like our lives were it was here and we would just go like for summer vacations or like to just reconnect with family so but it was always good memories and that's why I went back in 2011 because I always had like this good memory of Yemen yeah it was just like people happy it was a fun place like I was a little kid like I can just go outside have fun just these things that you're not allowed to do here and like it yeah it was just like it always like positive connotation to Yemen so yeah, I hear you I used to go back in the summertime and it was fun and family oriented and safe I think that was the key thing that it was I remember it being safe um even if it was nighttime yeah um so I know you lived in Yemen um from 2011 to 2015. Uh, what do you call, if anything at all, from the revolution once it entered Yemen? Um, so I went there, I, I just graduated eighth grade. And when I went, I already, like, like my family here were like revolutionary. My dad was already taking me to protests when since I was younger. I didn't know much about what it was, but it was just like fun going to protests and seeing people scream. And so when I went to Yemen, like the, my aunt and my uncle, they were like my aunt had a really like a um, vital role in in like the 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 revolution in that, and that's where like it started. And like whether like whether 
my family wanted to be part of it or not. They were just all thrusted into this revolution because of its geographic location. And so like going there to Yemen, already having an idea of like, like an idea of what's happening, but it was just like images that I see on TV. It never really like clicked to me that I would actually like live it. And so just like, protest was like uh, another day like it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday and we would like go in the morning and go in the afternoons especially because like my aunt like played like she was one of the organizers so I got to live like through her eyes and like through her activism and what and like all this like she faced so much um criticism and like pushback and backlash but like she was so resilient in it and I think like that passion I think like it was so contagious so and just it was scary like one time we were at the protest and literally we moved to pray and then five minutes later that place where we were protesting for the women's side was bombed and it was just like whoa that could have been like us but like i know i'm saying it with a smile but looking back on it it was just like that's okay like it just that's like, that's what happens. That's what comes with the cause of freedom or it comes with the cause of like a better life or a better opportunity. And I just like, I, I don't know, I became desensitized to all of like the things surrounding me. It was like, it was so cool to me. Like I see it in movies when I was here, like action movies, now I get to be part of it, you know? So I guess that really like helped me like look at everything and like even, yeah, like my aunt, like she was very like active but then I had family who were very very much opposing to it and I get to see their side of the story I get to see like this like to have this like uh kind of different opposing views and why and I get to form my own opinion based on all their different uh views it's not like I was just exposed to one side and that's it but it was just like I get to form my own identity and have like this kind of like my own critical thinking and that was really important because like in Yemen, you would think that just people just follow like whatever their parents say. That's the case at all. Like everyone had their own opinion, whether you agree, agree with it or not, whether you like, whether like it was informative or educated or like you just, everyone had their own opinions. Uh, like mothers rebel from their daughters or da like husbands and wives. Everyone had like, and you get to be exposed to that and form your own opinions. And like, I don't know, it was great. Like it was dangerous, of course, and scary, but <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, you said that uh, you said that it was a Tuesday and then there was a bombing, but that's just the cost of freedom, or that's just the cost of rebellion, or um, like a revolution. I can't even imagine going to a protest here and having even cops surrounding us. Not to mention like tear gas or even like. Uh, a bombing. What was that like coming from the states? And we have pretty much a what you would yeah. call a safe community, uh, safer. You know, we're not obviously having to deal with a, a war. But what was that like the first time you ever heard a bombing? So, like the first time I went there, I'm like, oh my god, guns everywhere. <laughs> no, what's this? Like it was, it was definitely a culture shock with the guns. Um, so even when I went to Yemen, it would just be like, oh, you go from a car to like this, like you were sheltered in a sense, you know, but when I was like, oh, like I get my freedom, I get to like go out by myself and like guns were everywhere. So you get accustomed to that, like people have restraints, it's not like, it's not like over here, oh my God, by the guns is highly um, like uh, politicized in Yemen. That's just like everyone has a gun and you get adjusted to it. It's, it's part of the culture. Um, so that was like getting used to it and then just like everyone around me was so brave like you just their bravery was so contagious you know and like yeah we were scared like just every day like you like we would protest in the morning and then and then we would like hear gunshots or like this died or and then it would just be like no one no one stopped no one like that didn't deter them or that didn't scare them and so their bravery and their love for like this new change like people didn't have anything to lose and so it was just, it was just really like, I, I came from like a sheltered place as well. Like, like just, 
yeah I went to protest here but it was just like safety relatively like it was safe it was like you go home take like you know what I mean but over there it was like these people had nothing to lose and when you have nothing to lose like brave like it, death is not a, like it's not scary and so all of that and like their freedom and like all, and just and just their 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 willingness how far they're willing to go for for freedom and better opportunities was really 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 um, empowering i remember um we had a neighbor who, who she had like four sons one of them died was killed Actually, one of them was killed. The oldest was killed, and she just cried, kissed him, and told the other son to go onto the battlefield. And it was just like, whoa! Like you're not like it was just like, and it was just like that's just like that's what you do for your country. And I was just like, wow! And so it was this bravery, this this courage for a new life, for new opportunities. They have been denied so much, and so yeah, like no one was there scared. So why should I be? You know, I, I got you get desensitized again to like all of this. Wow, um, that's amazing and, and crazy to hear, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine, um, you know, because we 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 want to say that or we want to think that we're brave by, you know, getting a permit and scheduling a protest or even, you know, um, some kind of civil disobedience and somebody getting arrested and then paying $50 and getting out and whatever. And, um, but I just, I don't know what that's like protesting, um, you know, during uh, an uprising. So, um, you know, you talk about what happened during like the revolution and, and how people were in the streets and how people were so brave and it was contagious. I'm already feeling like I wish I was there. Um, but what was it like when the Civil War broke out? Because I think that level of danger shifted. It was, I can imagine, yes. more, more dangerous. Can you tell us a little bit about how it was when if it was like the Arab Spring and then there was a revolution, there was like a democratic spirit that waved through the Middle East and North Africa. Um, but, but because everybody was out in the streets, all types of political groups and um, even like, uh, um, ethnic ethnic groups that lived in Yemen all were out, you know, trying to fight for a better Yemen. Um, but then internal clashes began, and and then I think in 2014 is when the civil route, uh, the civil war, began. What was it like at that time, if you can remember? Yeah. So like before, it was like there's a solidarity, like like there was just genuine. In Yemen, generally speaking, there was this like yes, it was violence and death, but it was different kind. It was it was this kind of like for like hope and opportunities and change lie ahead. Like there's light at the end of the tunnel, and there was like the solidarity. There were songs. There was like and as she like a revolutionary. So you feel the spirit of all, of it all. But um, the 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 intervention and the. Like it really, it really changed the dynamics within Yemen and people's courageous. It was just, I remember that day vividly because I had a friend's wedding, and I remember like our like our neighbors like knocking on our doors and we're like, like it was like around five in the morning or five thirty or like around that time. We're like, yeah, can you guys open the generator because like the, for electricity to see what's on TV. And we were just like, well, it's five in the morning, but okay. And then that's when we found out like the the bombing started by the by the Saudi led coalition, and like all of this is happening. And I was just like, yeah, that was sad to me, but it was far. I still wanted to go to my friend's wedding, like that that was that day, and it was it was I I wasn't able to go. My parents were like, no way, you were gonna go, and the wedding hall was bombed. And it was just like, it was just like, okay, this is getting real. Like, this is a wake up call. And like people, like even within people, it became, it became different in terms of like, yeah, like when, when, when people were fighting like different, like it was different back then because like you disagree whether you like the president or not. Now it's like you're disagreeing or agreeing whether like this, this is okay. Like the factions that I have shifted completely 
and you see families on the different kind of battlefields. You have like brothers go on like one pro Saudi fight on that side, and then you have like the pro um, Houthi on the other side killing each other. So it's be- and like desperation. Like before, you can like manage it. It's a battlefield. Like it's a gun to a gun. But now it's like bombs, and they're like just everywhere. Like you don't know the market. Nothing was safe. Nothing was safe, like a marketplace, schools, hospitals, everything, like nothing was off limits. I think that's like what really scared us and like everyone, like we were like really, sh- this never happened. And like to know that like it was, it was our, like the elected democratic president that signed off and like just okay with all of this. And it was just really, it really broke the spirit of many people, including me, I was like really like there was nothing you can do. Protest, you'll get bombed. Like it, it that spirit was it really disappeared because it was killed because like you cannot fight it. It was too don't you can fight it, but not with like you're not on the streets like you used to, and and it was just a really really tough time. Houses were bombed. Our house, our house personally was bombed. Like um, our uncle's house was bombed. Like many families were, like houses were bombed, and it was just like, it was, it was, it was the norm. Like we accepted. We were just waiting when, like our neighbor's neighbor's house is gonna be bombed. That's uh, nothing was uh, school stopped. It was really scary. I remember once, like, and people were still going onto the roof see where the bomb lands like who does that but like they were like yeah let's see and take videos of it and like it was it was really 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 scary time uh like my uncle he was he was a he's a government worker he's like in the army and like because of like his political like beliefs or whatever it was like he was like attempted assassination on him multiple times and we were just really scared about that it was a really really violent time we would sleep in the kitchen because it's like the safest place to sleep. Like if our house is bombed, we were just waiting for our death. Like we wanted, my parents wanted us to leave the country as soon as possible. But every time we tried to leave, the airports closed. Everything, it was really hard to leave the country. And it was just, it was, yeah, it was just like really, really a war zone. It was a war zone and people just didn't expect it to escalate. Because, yeah, like it was trouble, like it was cool, it was like internal problems that were happening, but now it just escalated way, like more than we all expected. And yeah. Yes, thank you for sharing, Hothad. I think, um, you know, a lot of us are, ha- it's kind of hard for us to imagine. Um, and I think you glossed over it so quickly because it's something that you experienced. And for us, we're like, whoa, what do you mean your house was bombed? Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm hearing from you that it was, um, you know, there was this spirit, uh, this revolutionary spirit that was on the ground that was contained for the most part, that it was very sanctions, like it has been historically in Yemen, um, tribalism reigns. So there has been historic you know, differences historically. Um, but like you said, it's been contained um, because folks have been on the ground, even if they are in different um, areas or, or different villages or different tribes, this is a different beast. Um, the airstrikes that are led by Saudi Arabia and uh, supported by this coalition of eight to 10 countries backed and supported by the US and the UK is a different beast because you have the enemy from above and it's it's no longer on the ground alone. Um, so I can just imagine, I mean, I, I honestly, I can't imagine, I can't imagine having my house um, striked by, by bombs. And then to know as, you know, for me as a Yemeni American, knowing that our, our taxpayers, um, our, our tax money is going to fund these wars and companies like Lockheed Martin or Raytheon or General Dynamics, all these um, really wealthy companies that are based here in the U.S. are bombing your home, other people's homes, committing war crimes in our name. It's why we continue to do this work. So 
I want you to go into kind of a little bit more details, if you will, if you forgive me for prying, but your house was bombed and then you were sleeping in the kitchen. What was that like? Oh, no. Um, so it wasn't bombed while we were in it, but it was like we were just waiting. Like we were in, we anticipated it being bombed. That's basically what it is. But like luckily and we, for those days, we would sleep in the kitchen. If it did get bombed, at least like it's the safest place, but it wasn't. Um, God, we were in it. We um we evacuated from that because that area um grew increasingly unsafe. So we evacuated to another house in, in Hoban. It's a it's a safer place. So we had another house there, and um yeah. So when we moved there, like two weeks later, the house was bombed. Um, it was uh, my uncle's house was bombed, and like like he he worked he worked um. Him and his wife, his wife is teacher, and she, they both, like, spent their life savings building this house. You know what I mean? And they just see it, like, now dogs are living in it. It was really, really heartbreaking to see, like, my uncle, who I've never seen, like, cried in his life, just, like, shed a tear about his house that he spent, like, his sweat and, like, blood on it. And it's, and, and then just moving to another place and just leaving everyone you know and... Um, like, and then him getting kidnapped, him and, like, my other uncle also, like, got kidnapped. We didn't know where they were. Still, we don't, it's been four years, almost five years. We have no idea where they are. And when some people claim that they are held in UAE prisons, some are, like, for just being at the wrong place at the wrong time. So it's, like, really, really dangerous right now in Yemen. And I left. When it was relatively safe, like, yeah, that time was, like, really bad. But, like, when I speak to my cousins back home, they're like, yeah, we wish they romanticized those days. Like, those were days were the safer ones. And, like, when they speak of their, they're in Hoban, it does. And so when they speak of, like, going to their old house or to visit their neighbors and, and also in Taiz, they claim that Hoban, like, they call it Taiz because it's so far like you have, it takes a, a day of traveling, like eight to 10 hours to get to like inside Taz, to the Medina of it, because of like so much checkpoints, so much, um, every like thugs, everyone holding, um, everyone holding like checkpoints and trying to loot people. And like based on like your last name or like who do you follow, they, and then they recruit and the thing is, even um, like within Daesh, like it's broken, and, and like the UAE is not just like in Sokoto Island, and um, and um, Adam, but it's also in Daesh, and the way it's used, and the way they operate in Daesh is they have I don't I don't know like if you're like very um, if you're, if you know the places in Daesh very well, but in and. I remember them specifically because I lived there in a while and like I have family all over. So like in, in Jumhuria, in, inside Daesh, it's it's now being controlled by UAE backed men. Yeah, they're Yemeni, but they're paid by UAE. They're young men who are desperate for work, who are desperate for, they've been deprived of an education. They've been deprived. They have families that they have to feed. And so, yeah, they took good money from the, UA, from the UAE and they're loot. They're they're giving um, weapons and they're giving houses to loot, to loot their fellow Yemenis, their fellow neighbors, their friends. They just they become uh, merciless, and that's with the encouragement and the support of UAE. So even within inside dies, you have the pro Hadi, you have the pro like UAE factions, you have the Houthi factions, and then you have the civilians all fighting for. Well, not of course of civilians, but like it's so it's within even does it's so so fractured, and there are so many um factions, and it's at the cost of ordinary civilians, and all of were yeah like all of them were all we're all Yemenis at one point. Well, we still are, but like we're all like just ordinary people just wanting to go home to our family, school, like live our day day to day life, and now that whole um. I guess picture have changed. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Kofar, I want to mention one of our viewers. 
um, Mustafa Hussein said, Kid were, kids are always going up to the roof to see where the airstrikes landed and they adapted within a month, mashallah, because the Yemenis are resilient. Um, you were saying earlier this something similar where, you know, um, coming from the States, going to, to Yemen, everybody's kind of strapped and armed, but then you got accustomed to it and then airstrikes started happening and it was scary, but then you got accustomed to it and it's kind of this resilience that we're seeing um, coming from Yemen that you also experience. Can you talk a little bit about some of the people, maybe your neighbors or um, other people you knew that, um, you know, how, how were their thoughts? How were their feelings? Um, how did they experience um, what you were experiencing? Were they as resilient? Um, I can talk about my cousins and they were just even the neighborhoods, like even like these 10 year olds, 10 year olds like, oh, did you see that? And pointing to the building and I'm just like, oh my God, you guys are crazy. Let's go inside, you know? And I just like, that's just like, that's the norm. It, it's it's a, that's the norm. Like they're not scared of like this bomb. Like they all they see is like that's all. Some some kids that's all they've ever known. And so when like I know my little cousin, like he just like if he doesn't hear bullets, he's like oh like he like he waits for bullets to go to sleep. Like that's how, uh, and he's what like seven or eight years old. And he was born like during the revolution and now like this like so it's it's um it's really disheartening because it's the kids are internalizing it they have been desensitized to it they don't know but like yeah it's bravery and courage but at the same time it's gonna affect them in the long run um and it's just, just like every kid was like that even the teenagers every teenagers the teenagers the ones that were able to they would just go get closer and try to like oh like to see and like look at the like what's like get get having like a in-depth look of what's happening but the ones that were like the little kids and like they always just like point at the building be like oh my god and, and just look at it with fascination yeah that's pretty uh you know profound um you know we put our kids to sleep here uh, using white noise so they can feel soothed. You know, I can't imagine having a child go to sleep uh, being comforted by the sound of, you know, bullets, bombs. It's it's really sad, and it it makes me think about um, you know it's been six years since the civil war, and five years since the intervention. The children who were born six or five years ago um, are children of war. So even if the war stops. I mean, as we've heard, there's a unilateral ceasefire that was announced a few days ago by the coalition. Um, but as we all know, that uh, did not last. Um, but even if the war ends and the infrastructure has to be rebuilt, the economy has to be rebuilt, and then the trauma that all of these younger um, People, younger people, older people, all kinds of people who have had to live under um, airstrikes, bombs, under a war zone. It is going to take so much to rebuild and just restore and repair, um, you know, the people of Yemen. Um, and it's so good to hear that, you know, even with everything that's going on, that Yemeni people are resilient, and um, it's it's amazing. Uh, looking for that resilience to be realized very soon under a peaceful Yemen, inshallah. Um, so you left kind of right uh, after the intervention began. The intervention began of March 2015, and then you left, I think, in November. So what was that like? How were you able to leave? Yeah, so we were trying to leave. My parents wanted out wanted us out the country since like 2013. They were like, like, they're like, it's too unsafe. Like, go, like, we have to come back. And then every time I tried to like leave, like something would happen with the US Embassy in Sana'a. And in 2000, 
2015, where my dad was like, absolutely, like, you guys have to leave. And the embassy was closed. And then he heard about people living through Djibouti. And like in Aden, it was, uh, it was really like, Aden was in chaos. And my dad was like, yeah, like, I, I know people, like, I heard, like, we just have to pay this amount and, like, to get you out the country and there you'll be good and whatever. And I was just like, okay, like, sure. <laughs> and, like, my sister, she was, she was young, she's much younger than me and she was, like, she was a child and, and my parents went out there and so I was, like, her legal guardian. And we went to Adan, which was, like, a very, very, very unsafe um car ride um we had to like duck like for three four hours and just like went to duck and went like gunshots and we're just like okay um and then we finally reached Aden like and then from there it's the boat was not how I imagined like imagined it was like small boat like there were like it was over capacity. Like the people that were on the boat were all like people fleeing. They were desperate pe- Yemenis fleeing to try to search for a better, um, like pl- safety outside of Yemen. And so, some of them were held in a camp. Some of them, like had like were American citizens also, and they were just leaving Yemen because it's unsafe. And some of them were like their husbands or like their parents or their families were sponsoring them and they had appointments in like the consulate in Djibouti. And so like the boat itself, it was it was very small and over um it was like really over capacity. It was more than twenty four hours. The boat was on the verge of right like uh sink sinking multiple times. It was just like a really really horrible ride and when we finally like we were stopped at a camp and we're like people were just like more than half of the people like it was just like one third of the people that remained on the boat and all of those that did not all of those that left well they were forced to leave the boat were like Yemenis who didn't have like documentation to leave outside of Yemen and they were just they were held at a camp there where like the weather was like over 100 degrees. It was horrible, like it was very, very hot that day, sunny. They were gonna be in a, in a camp over 100 degrees and the food was there was horrible. I, don't, I really don't know how, like it's very inhumane. The conditions were inhumane. Um, like, as, like they were about to treat us like this, me and my sister, but then like when we showed them our documents, they noticed it was an American passport and automatically like we were treated like oh my god we're so sorry and like an automatic like that sense of nationalism that i was like exposed to firsthand which i never really like um really valued i guess like being a oh, like american citizen or whatever but at that moment it was just like wow like this document really like it proves that i am better than someone else and it was just like we're all Yemenis, we were all fleeing, we all had like similar story, we we're all playing like danger and like a war zone. And it was just like really, um, it, it was a wake up call for me at that time, really. And I think that moment really kind of like uh, inspired me to like, whatever I do in the future, just to work with, like with refugees. And because that moment really like impacted and shaped my, my, uh, my beliefs because we're all the same and and then when we reached Djibouti we had we had family there um who were living there for like who were living there and he had he owned a company and who was just living there before the war so he was relatively like well and he adjusted to there we stayed there for a while but like that moment when we left the camp it was really haunting for me and my sister we weren't exposed to that and we made friends on the boat and yeah so uh, this almost sounds like a a movie, Kofar. Uh, <laughs> I know, <laughs> like yeah, I guess. <laughs> I can't it's imagine. A, it's a <laughs> unique story. Like within Yemenis, this is not like it's an a story that you would hear every day. But like because of like American and American lifestyle, oh my God, you live this. But like in Yemen, this is the norm. I mean, I'm 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 like whoa. To me, it's a sport. It's it's crazy. I mean, I remember when the Muslim ban first 
uh, was signed. I was working in immigration and there were a lot of Yemenis stuck in Djibouti um, because the embassy had closed in Yemen and they were telling me about such harsh, harsh conditions, really high prices, high cost of living, really, really hot. So um, yeah, I can just imagine that it was really, really hard. And I hear you saying that because you lived through that, you kind of made an oath to yourself um, that you're gonna do what you can to uplift the voices of Yemenis. I have a question here um, from, from, let me see, Saleh Ahmed, I believe. Kothar, what advice do you have uh, for Yemeni youth? Um, get involved. <laughs> I mean, and like, yeah, this is such a big term, get involved. It can mean so much things, but really like just, just, and I'm not saying this in like, because Jihan is here, but like really just Jihan's work within, uh, with the Yemen Alliance Committee has been like a blueprint for all of us. Like her advocacy with like local, um, with like her trying to grassroots campaigns and like with our local representatives and like Congress and just literally activism within your first, first educate yourself on what's happening on the ground. Get the numbers because because Yemenis in Yemen are like they're depending on us like on like the diaspora outside because they no one's listening to them no one's like alleviating their voices or their pain and it's just like they like we are their only hope and just educating ourselves on this and just activism can just be like you petition like talking to your local representative, organizing a rally, something like that, just talking to your classmates. It, it's, and it depends on like an individualized level. So yeah. Kofar, um, yeah, I agree. I think getting, thank you so much also. I mean, thank you for, for your shout out. Appreciate it. I think it's teamwork and makes the dream work for sure. Um, and when we talk about numbers, I just wanted to quickly point out that um, with a population of over 28 million in Yemen, 17 million Yemenis are food insecure, over 2 million are internally displaced. That means they may have lost their homes. Um, and uh, because of the way uh, Yemenis are culturally, um, Yemenis tend to be internally displaced because they would rather stay within Yemen rather than seek refuge outside of Yemen. You don't find uh, a large amount of refugees from Yemen in comparison to those from other countries because Yemenis would prefer to live and die in their land. Um, uh, over 14 million Yemenis don't have access to clean drinking water. So when we think about um, how many cases, overwhelm 1 million, maybe 2 million cases of cholera uh, cholera is extremely contagious and it is uh, spread through water um, and then unclean water specifically. And now when we're thinking about COVID, um, you know, the CDC is constantly warning us or reminding us that we have to wash our hands with soap and water and keep social distancing. If over 14 million Yemenis don't have access to clean drinking water, they're not going to have water and soap to clean themselves with in order to prevent or to keep COVID away. So, um, you know, as, as we heard that COVID has entered Yemen, uh, we have heard that there's one case, reported case so far. Um, we're praying um, that it does not spread because COVID for Yemen would definitely be a, um, a death sentence. I mean, there are airstrikes, there's a conflict on the ground, there's a famine, uh, there's the coalition, um, that has uh, blockaded, um, you know, the, restricted the the movement of people, of food, of water, of supplies. Um, so it, there's really a, a confinement of where Yemenis can live and what they what they have access to. Um, and then with respect to the casualties, there have been over 100,000 Yemenis who have been killed by the violence. Um, and when we talk about the famine, uh, over 85,000 Yemeni children. Uh, may have starved to death. So um, 
numbers are chilling and alarming. And recently the UN reported that um, the death toll or their predictions of the death toll for 2020 may be well over 230,000. So that is just um, heartbreaking to hear that uh, this is a trend that we love, that we all remember being safe in, and these are the conditions. Um, I want to hear you talk a little bit, uh, Kofet, of, um, you know, I know that the revolution living in Yemen, the revolution really inspired you and you're such a vocal advocate now. Um, can you tell us you know, how hard it's been being separated from family? Um, so my immediate family is here, uh, but it's like, like both of my, like, my family, from, like extended family from both my parents' sides is in Yemen, are in Yemen. And so when we call them, it's, it's like my mom has to like call her, like her sister twice or three times. So we, and like all of this, like, it's just like my mom, the call ends with my mom crying. Or like, if it's not about her sister, it's about someone we know, or it's about like our neighbor. Or it's, it's so, so it's like, that's just, and like, sometimes I forget because like I'm just living my life here. I have like I go in and out like and sometimes and then just like that call it's like oh my god yeah I like it, it energizes me back to like think about that time in Yemen and it's just and like when we call our cousins or or our like neighbors and like like I like some of them were in college like they were in like medical school and because of like the war in Yemen like. She's like one of my cousins was like, I, I dream, I worked so hard to go into medical school. I worked so hard. I like, and now she, she, she can't go to school anymore. Like her degree, she won't be able to finish like the school that she was going to and her housing, the one that she had to move to another place. And it was bombed. And it was just like, they're deprived of education. They're deprived of everything. And then the next week we would call and they're just like happy and like just forget that happened and just moved on with their life like with all of that that's going on and everything that they're being deprived of they're still so optimistic about life yeah that's amazing the optimism and the resilience is something i think a lot of us can learn from because we take our safety and our privilege for granted which is why we are all kind of in this fight um, because we feel an obligation to speak up for the millions the voiceless in Yemen um, so thank you for being brave I know there's not a lot of us doing this work that are Yemeni Americans um, so it does feel you know lonely and isolating so it's good to have fellow sister in crime like yourself, um, especially someone who is so young. Um, so like, let's say um, the lockdown ends right, uh, next week um, and there are young folks here listening. What is the first thing that they should do to get involved? Hmm. I would, I would get, in, I would educate myself about the war power resolution and try to engage our like politicians about that and how we can try to advance it. And tr like personalize our stories to these politicians because they don't know. Like sometimes it's so, you can you can seem so um, distant from it or like these are just numbers or these are just like, but like when you personalize these stories, like people are gonna listen to you and and just like, when you also talk to your neighbors about them, talk to your friends about it and like go in numbers. So when, when you do that, like people will start talking, like lis hearing, listening to you. And if they don't, of course, if you're not disruptive, be effective. If you're not effective, like disruptive, you're not effective. There's other routes to do it. I like that. If you're not disruptive, you're not effective. Yeah. <laughs> I, that, Kofed. I just wanted to, um, let our viewers know uh, what you were referring to when you said the war powers resolution. 
Um, the War Powers Resolution is legislation that would direct the removal of the United States Armed Forces from hostilities um, in the Republic of Yemen that have not been by, uh, authorized by Congress, which they have not. Um, and we have been since 2016 trying to push and pass uh, a War Powers Resolution that would end U.S. support to the Saudi-led coalition and their aggression on Yemen. And um, you know, I think last year there was a really big victory. Um, a Senate joint resolution was passed through both chambers. It was bipartisan. Both Republicans and Democrats agreed uh, and passed it, but unfortunately, President Trump vetoed it. Uh, so we are currently in the process. Um, you know, I now I know now everybody's kind of in a break because of the lockdown but as soon as we get out of this quarantine um, situation uh, we hope to push our lawmakers to propose a new war powers resolution a strong one that will once and for all remove uh, u.s support for the saudi-led coalition because without the u.s support um, the coalition would not be able to do uh, what it's doing and what is it doing? The U.S. has backed and supported the Saudi-led coalition in its war on Yemen by pro providing Saudi Arabia with intelligence sharing, targeting assistance, and logistical support. And American engineers are repairing uh, Saudi warplanes. And up until recently, uh, the U.S. was uh, refueling Saudi warplanes mid-air, so they don't have to land and get their air uh, and get their um, you know, oil, they can get it while they're hovering above and continue striking um, without wasting time. Uh, in addition, uh, the U.S. is the largest arms sales uh, exporter and Saudi Arabia is the largest arms sales importer. So, you know, there's a lot of exchange and, um, and transactions and, and contracts that are being made. And we know that money and interests are the largest influencers. So um, I guess I agree that uh, folks can uh, call on their lawmakers. And when we when we talk about like what can folks do, I think I wanted to hopefully end it with that. That what can folks do? There's a lot that we can do. Um, we live in a world of social media, um, and it's so easy to advocate now because you have your phone or your tablet or computer in your hand and you can press some numbers and tweet at your lawmaker and call them out. So um, you can use your social media platforms, you can call. Um, I will include this number, but I, I'll say it right now real quick. 202-224-3121 uh, is the number that you can call and it is a switchboard that will connect you to your lawmaker. Um, so you put that number in, then they'll connect you to your lawmaker based on your zip code. And then all you have to do is either leave a message or talk to someone and just say, yo, you know, what's happening? Yemen doesn't represent me and I want the U.S. to stop supporting war crimes. Um, so we, if, we were, if we were to flood them with calls and emails and tweets um, with the same messaging, then Yemen would, um, you know, uh, be mainstream, if you will, because Yemen has been called a forgotten war because the media has been silent um, and there's not a lot of support in, uh, in DC because there is a lot of money that is coming in from the Saudis and they pay in cash. So, um, you know, calling on your lawmakers, tweeting at them and donating um, is another way folks can help. Um, Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation is the pretty much the only organization that the Yemeni Alliance Committee supports because 100% of your proceeds go directly to the people in Yemen. There aren't any overhead um, costs, so you can rest assured that your money is going to those in need. In addition, uh, recently the World Food Program and USAID, both uh, humanitarian agencies that have been supporting over 80% of Yemen's population, suspended aid. So this is basically uh, a step that we believe is uh, politicizing food or using food as a weapon. So we're calling on folks to call on USAID and the World Food Program to resume aid into Yemen. Like I said, the war, famine, a blockade, COVID, floods, and now Ramadan is coming. 
uh, next week. Uh, when we say hashtag Yemen can't wait, it is because Yemen cannot wait. We can't be talking about this for another six, seven years. It has been five, six years of these conditions. And uh, unfortunately, because of the way politics works, we have to peel away at the many, many layers of, of this aggression. And as American citizens, this is uh, a very simple thing that we can do is call on our lawmakers to get out, you know, get the intervention out. And then Yemen is gonna continue dealing with the internal factions, unfortunately, but it can't even begin to do that uh, with the intervention and the disruption and the destruction from these airstrikes coming from above. It's just, um, it's it's not an, an equal playing field. Um, so um, I wanted to close. If you have any last remarks, Kothar. Um, no, thank you for having me. Uh, I really appreciate all the work that you do for Yemen. And just, yeah, like for the viewers and everyone who's listening. Thank you. Am I on mute? No, you can hear me? No. <laughs> now you can hear me? Okay, cool. Um, thank you to everyone for watching and uh, stay tuned and follow our page for how you can get involved and how you can be an advocate a fierce advocate like Kothar. Okay, everyone, take care.